Hey everyone, uh, so coming back, continuing our discussion of null steering, uh, the straightforward thing is to recognize we have a constrained optimization problem, right? We're trying to minimize a vector or magnitude squared of a vector subject to a linear constraint. So once again, our favorite answer, bring him onto the screen, there is Lagrange, who technically is our favorite Frenchman when it comes to constrained optimization, but it is worth noting uh, that he was actually born Italian and then became a naturalized French citizen. He had a pretty amazing life. Uh, so uh, we're going to do this with Lagrange multipliers. So let's set up our optimization court problem. Right, so using the trick we saw last time, we're going to pretend W and W Hermitian are complete strangers to each other and don't know anything about each other so that we can take the gradient with respect to one for a complex function. And so that magnitude squared of the error I can write in this form. I can say that's the magnitude squared is always of a vector is the inner product of the vector with itself. And then the key for complex gra gradient uh, Lagrangians, we also, just to be safe, we don't know lambda is necessarily real. We need to write this as two times the real part so that we can write it as the constraint plus the conjugate of the constraint, just in case, depending on where we've picked the phase center or how the problem works out, we still get a real constraint here. So setting the real, two times the real part equal to zero guarantees that will work out. Often in hindsight, once we know the answer, we can say, oh, if I choose this phase center for the array, I'm guaranteed to have lambda be real and I can simplify it a bit. So this is often just being extra careful, but it's good to be extra careful and not lose parts of the problem on the floor. So if we write this out as, as this as uh, the argument plus its conjugate, we get this equation, where again, the first term is the same as the error term, the thing we're trying to minimize. And then this is the constraint plus its conjugate. And I'm leaving these lambdas at the, at the back. In fact, I'm going to stop right here and change those lambdas into gamma, because I don't want people to confuse them with wavelength. This is just a dummy variable. It's the Lagrange, no, Lagrange multiplier constraint variable or the Lagrange multiplier, not that we should ever use dummy and Lagrange in the same sentence, but it's just a placeholder variable. Okay, so that's better. Even though we normally use lambda as a sort of default in most calculus books for Lagrange multipliers, we're going to use gamma here so there's no chance we get this mixed up with wavelength anywhere, just to be safe. So to minimize this, what do we do? Same thing, same old story, story as old as time. Well, not maybe quite that old, but take the gradient and set it equal to zero. And the trick we saw last class, or the, the technique we saw last class for doing this for complex vectors is it's usually get to the answer in a hurry or sooner if we take this gradient with respect to W Hermitian. All right, so when we do that and set it equal to zero, we take with respect to W Hermitian, uh, for this first term, we'll have a W Hermitian times the second term. So when I take that gradient, I get this, and then the second term also gives me a W Hermitian, right? I end up with v, the manifold of the jammer <clears throat> times lambda equals zero, right? So this is my, my Lagrange multiplier equation. So solving for this, I can easily find that my new weight vector is going to be my desired weight vector when I bring that over to the other side, minus, the, oh, I keep writing gamma can't get it out of my system. I keep writing lambda instead of gamma. This should be a gamma. Minus the placeholder variable gamma times v sub j. Right, so if I think about what's going on here, I could say if, if I thought about this in block diagram form, I say I'm going to feed my array data, right, my, phase, my vector of phases for the narrowband data into a beam former that's W Hermitian, I've already learned an important way to solve this problem to get the beamformer output, which is just by putting this in here, it's saying the way, even though I don't know the final answer, I know what it looks like, is it says, take your original desired ideal beamformer, right, that's the first term, and then also you're going to feed it through another beamformer that is the manifold, using the manifold vector when I take the Hermitian of W, I get the Hermitian of the manifold vector scaled by some constant that we still need to find, right? We need to find the gain on this branch and then subtract that off. 
right? So it's saying take the desired thing you had before and have a parallel branch where you project onto the uh, look. Basically, this is like the um, the look direction. I'm sorry, the the CBF for the jammer. So pr process it as if you were trying to find the jammer. Apply some gain and subtract it off, and this will be the effective beam former. This structure has a name. It comes up so often. This idea of taking the desired thing. And this structure is called a generalized side lobe canceler. So this is a good uh, technique to know about. Is that often we're going to take some, if we knew what our ideal desired thing is, we're going to have that as one parallel branch and the other branch is going to go compute that annoying interfere as if we're trying to find it and then subtract it off from the original thing and that will be the overall best thing to do. So we've shown our optimal answer has this structure even though we don't know yet what the scaling factor is. To do that we go back to our original constraint. We go back and plug into the original constraint. So I'm going to get a clean page and start on that now. Right, so when I do that I get W Hermitian VJ equals zero. So I plug in what I just found for W, which I say I want the desired beamformer minus some scaled version of the manifold vector for the jammer, Hermitian of all that, times Vj. So let's multiply these through. What I find is I get Wd Hermitian Vj minus, if I bring this Hermitian inside, this becomes gamma conjugate V Hermitian V sub J Hermitian equal to zero. So I can bring this over to the other side and find that I'll get W sub D Hermitian V sub J equals gamma star V J Hermitian V J. So I'm trying to solve this for, remember I'm, I'm in this, def, I'm, I'm in this derivation to find the scaling factor gamma, the gain on that bottom branch of the generalized side lobe thing. So uh, I could just actually multiply these out and simplify it if I needed to, but I'm going to leave it this way. Pretend this to set me up for something more complicated later. Uh, in the scalar or the single constraint case, this would be easy, but let's just pretend this is more complicated. I could say this is like multiplying on the right by the inverse of this. So I'd get WD Hermitian V sub J times V sub J, V sub J Her Hermitian inverse. Right? If I multiply that on the right, I now have gamma star on the right. So taking the conjugate of both sides, I end up that the scaling factor, that Lagrange multiplier gain, is going to be, when I take the uh, conjugate of this, these two flip around. I get Vj Hermitian times Wd over Vj Hermitian Vj, which again for the scalar plane wave this would just be an n. So this is basically saying this is the uh, essentially the beam pattern in the or, or the inner product between the uh, jammer and the original desired weights. All right. So if I go put this back into my uh, previous equation. Back up here, right? What this tells me, right? I get my my end. I do finally get my answer for W. I say W is the original desired vector, minus. Right, I had gamma times V sub J. Now plugging that in for gamma, I get W D at long last, times. I can I can move some of these terms around and get Vj, Vj Hermitian, right, by putting the gamma after Vj, and then the denominator is Vj Hermitian, Vj. Right, this, uh, by treating this inverse, I moved it downstairs times the original W sub d. And looking at this, I, I can't resist that I, I've got to factor things, right? I can factor this out and say this is I minus the identity matrix times V sub J V sub J Hermitian over so that's the outer product over the inner product 
times the original W sub D. So this is the weight vector for my beam former. Let me make these parens a little more uniform. Right, so I take my original desired weight vector and multiply this by <clears throat> this matrix here, which is, is all related to the jammer. And, and we saw this in the, uh, the sort of warm-up video, a review video. This we would call the complementary projection matrix for the jammer manifold. Right, is basically saying take the original weights and, and find the component of those weights that is the projection of those weights that's orthogonal to the jammer direction is, is a geometric interpretation of what we've done. Right, so there's the sort of turn the crank and grind Lagrange multiplier approach that says if I want to find the beam pattern or the beam former that is as close as possible to my desired beam pattern but makes the one change of adding the notch in this direction B sub J, uh, I can go through the whole thing with Lagrange. I get to this idea of the generalized side lobe canceler that my ideal filter has this structure that I take the desired filter and then I have a parallel branch that where I, I instead steer the beam former to look at the jammer, take some gain of that. So I'm basically estimating the power in the jammer direction and subtracting it off, figuring out how much of that would have leaked into the, the desired thing, subtract it away, and I will get this answer here, right? geometrically. And so that's the sort of turn the crank approach. Uh, I'll stop the video here because it's already plenty long. Uh, and then in the next video, we'll talk about the smart and lazy way to find this.